This is MJB News with Michael Hartal and Gary Bershowski. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the MJB Newsroom. I'm Michael Hartal. And I'm Carrie Varshavsky, and this is MJB News. On this edition of MJB News, we will focus on some of the effects and impacts of COVID-19 on Israeli society. It's been almost six months since the pandemic spread throughout Israel. During this time, we have witnessed many ways in which COVID-19 has affected individuals, families, and communities. Much of the discourse about COVID-19 deals with social distancing, masks and hygiene, and flattening the curve. But there are a host of broader social issues beneath the surface, some of which originated with COVID-19, and others which were there all along, but were amplified and intensified by the pandemic. Domestic violence under quarantine, education arrangements for children with special needs, health behaviors during the pandemic, all of these issues and many others like them have emerged as critical social challenges in Israel and around the world. That's right, Michael. And one of the biggest issues is employment and how the world of work has been transformed by COVID-19. More and more people are working from home today. Some are finding it to be rewarding and beneficial, while others say that remote work is harder and less effective than working from the office and that it's decreasing their productivity. We spoke with Smadal Somech, head of the Brookdale Employment Team, to learn more about how COVID-19 has changed the world of work. Let's watch the segment that we prepared. For years, experts have predicted big changes to the world of work. More people working from home or remotely, flexible work schedules, digital communications, less job stability. Well, we saw some examples here and there, but no system-wide changes. That is, until COVID-19 came into our lives and changed everything. The entire working world was turned upside down. Within days, entire companies moved to work from home. Within weeks, whole sectors were shut down. Tens and thousands of people lost their jobs. Within months, the future of work has become the new reality. How did this happen to us? How do we understand these changes? Well, over the next few minutes, I would like to share with you some of our insights into the changing world of work, what it means for our communities, what it means to our families, and what it means to our society. When we talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the world of work, we have to remember that there is no single world. There are real differences between sectors of the economy, between types of workers, and between men and women. Back in March, when everything pretty much shut down, businesses scrambled to figure out how to keep things going as best they could. Some organizations were in better position than others, sometimes because they had done some advanced planning and sometimes because of the type of work they did. Information organizations such as Brookdale could make the transition easier. Our work involves a lot of individual work at the computer and our in-person meetings with government partners were easily transitioned to Zoom meetings. But other organizations had a harder time especially anything with significant customer interaction, such as restaurants or retail stores. After all, it is pretty difficult to serve a meal over the computer. As so many businesses scaled back or shut down, employees were put on a leave of absence or were fired. Between February and April, Israel's labor force changed dramatically. The number of people Seeking work jumped from 25,000 to 1 million. And those who were most affected were located at the bottom of the earning scale. On average, the new unemployed earned 30% less than the average worker. The ultra-Orthodox and the Arab populations, two of the most disadvantaged groups in Israel, were both harmed, but in different ways. 
23% of ultra-Orthodox working men and 30% of working women were on leave of absence compared to only 15% of non-Haredi men and 20% of non-Haredi women. In the Arab population, those who were most affected were young women ages 18 to 24. Actually, 41% of them were let go. There were also differences between men and women. At the beginning, a lot of people talked about how working from home would be good for women, but as the period continued, it became clear that this is not the case. 56% of all requests for unemployment benefits were from women. 21% of all working women were on a leave of absence compared to only 16% of men. These gender differences were more significant among Jews compared to Arabs. We should also combine the benefits of remote working with communication technologies as a way to increase productivity of men and women who have difficulties being away from home during the working day. This could be Arab women who have some limitation being alone in secular environment or have small children to look after. Or people with disabilities who can benefit from the situation where employers are much more lenient towards allowing their employees to work from home. A third opportunity is the chance to rethink the work-life balance. In a survey we conducted over the past couple of months, we looked into the new patterns of work during the peak of the crisis. We saw that there were two main ways that people felt about their work from home. 53% said that they preferred working from the office because the conditions at home made it hard to work effectively. Some said that their kids were in the way, while others said that they do not have sufficient space to work from. On the other side, the 47% who preferred to work from home said that their conditions allowed them to be productive and effective. So, what's Brookdale's contribution to all this? Throughout this entire period, we have been a constant source of objective, nonpartisan data that is helping national policymakers navigate their way through this unprecedented pandemic. This is a time of great uncertainty. The situation is not constant and it is evolving all the time. Policymakers need to make quick decisions and have very little concrete data to serve as a solid ground for decision making. This is exactly where Brookdale's strength come into play. We bring an evidence-based reflection of reality, answering questions such as to what extent were industries and employees harmed by COVID-19? How was the world of work changed in this period? We work at the formal and informal levels and in many ways, it is the informal that is critical. Countless times, I have received phone calls from government officials to ask, what do you know about this or that? In fact, just before Corona hit, I got a call from a ministry representative who asked, do we have recent data on gender gaps? Orenti Roche, one of my team members, was just at the Central Bureau of Statistics when I got this call. So I called him and I asked him to go to the guy who owns this data. He asked it for the latest raw data, gave him the code for processing the data and sent it back to the representative. She said, this is phenomena. Can I pass it to the minister? Can you talk about it at the government meeting? That says it all. They have a need. They call us. We answer it with data. She knows we are the source to figure out how to get it fast and to communicate it to non-researchers clearly. There is really no replacement for trust and personal relationship. The different government offices know that we will deliver the information quickly 
and precisely. You see, we do more than mine existing data sets. We conduct our own original research to develop new data and shed light on the most important policy questions. Our brand new survey that I have just mentioned on the world of work during the COVID-19 is a great example of this. We also have done other studies during this COVID period, including one on the Arab population and another one on the impact of COVID on different industries in Israel. So there you have it. The world of work has been greatly affected by COVID-19. By understanding the ramifications, we have been able to shine a light on the challenges and opportunities. We don't really know how everything will look when this is all over. But I do know that Brookdale is in a great position to monitor and measure the changes and help explain what they mean for the policymakers and for the public at large. Thank you, Smadal. What impressed me the most is how working from home or remotely impacts different people in different ways. For example, parents of young children People who live in small or crowded homes without quiet designated office space. People who work in service-oriented work with face-to-face -face interactions such as retail and the hospitality industry. Each face unique challenges in carrying out their work effectively from home. Oh, I agree, Carrie. It looks like one of the keys to making work from home effective and productive is going to require employers to take into consideration not only what type of work people do remotely, but also what their living arrangements and family situation looks like. These are going to be new and challenging factors for most employers, and it will likely take some time for them to learn to navigate these emerging considerations effectively. Thank you, Michael. And now to our next segment, telehealth. Telehealth is the use of electronic and digital tools such as phones, computers, and cameras to care for people's health from a distance. In one form or another, telehealth has been around for quite a while. Calling your doctor to get advice or your doctor calling in a prescription to a pharmacy are examples of telehealth that have been around for many years. Unquestionably, telehealth has leaped forward dramatically since the advent of the Internet and with the availability of easily accessible databases. Many people engage regularly in basic forms of telehealth, such as accessing health information on a healthcare provider's website, or a family physician accessing a patient's hospital discharge report online. Some additional, more advanced forms of telehealth include conducting an online consultation with a practitioner, video conferencing with a health professional, and in some cases, transmitting medical data in real time, such as an EKG, or even conducting a physical examination from a distance using electronic tools. Telehealth offers many benefits for both practitioners and patients. It can make healthcare more accessible to people located far from urban centers by eliminating travel time. And it can bring advanced, high quality care to underserved areas and populations at reduced cost. Telehealth also carries system-wide benefits by cutting down waiting times, reducing no-shows, streamlining delivery, and improving overall efficiency. However, despite its many advantages, telehealth has been slow in developing. Many reasons have been cited for this slow progress. Individual physician habits, entrenched organizational culture, concerns about information privacy, lagging technical infrastructure, and the lack of a strong driving force to revolutionize the provision of healthcare services. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic brought into focus many, if not all, of these issues. Under the extreme measures taken to limit people's mobility and enforce social distancing, both patients and healthcare providers found themselves more restricted in their ability to conduct traditional healthcare interactions in the regular clinical setting. Non-urgent care facilities were closed, or their business hours significantly reduced, and patients were hesitant to leave their homes and seek care at health facilities where they perceived an increased risk of coronavirus contagion. As a result, many patients elected to forego seeking both acute care and follow-up treatment for long-term chronic health problems. 
All of these developments presented an extraordinary opportunity for Brookdale to study the use of telehealth during the pandemic. How was it used? Did people manage to receive the healthcare services that they required? Who used telehealth more? The answers to these questions in the following segment. Telehealth is an emerging field and appears to be a growing opportunity to make the delivery of healthcare more efficient and equitable. Despite the long-standing interest in this field, much remains unknown about the practical aspects of telehealth. The COVID-19 pandemic, itself an unprecedented challenge for the healthcare sector, has provided an excellent window of opportunity to study the use of telehealth by consumers and to evaluate customer satisfaction with telehealth platforms currently in use in Israel. During the most intense initial days of the COVID lockdown, health policy researchers at the Myers JDC Brookdale Institute conducted an internet-based survey of over 1,200 respondents aged 20 to 64 over a period of four days at the end of April and the beginning of May 2020. This internet survey was supplemented by a telephone survey of an additional 300 people, ensuring that the final survey population of over 1,500 respondents was fully representative of the overall Israeli population, Jews and Arabs, secular and religious, urban and rural, and all levels of education. MJB's social scientists sought to answer the following questions. One, what were the characteristics of the patients who were using telehealth services during the pandemic restrictions? Two, which services did they receive? And three, what was their user experience? Some 500 people, or close to one third of the survey respondents reported contacting a caregiver using telehealth during the two months leading up to the survey just prior to the first wave of the pandemic. About 30% of people who sought telehealth care did so for ongoing treatment of a chronic pre-existing condition, while 23% did so for a new acute problem. Another 15% sought out telecare for a non-urgent problem, and an additional 15% used these services to seek out general information and consultation not associated with a specific medical problem. The remainder sought out telecare for a variety of additional health issues such as routine pregnancy follow-up. One of the main expectations from telehealth interactions is that they replace the need for a physical interaction. If telehealth can solve a problem, that is a positive development. But if it only creates an additional layer of bureaucracy, not only hasn't it helped, but it may in fact delay definitive care and make it more complex and confusing. With that in mind, the researchers asked the survey respondents whether their telehealth interaction made a physical meeting redundant or unnecessary. Encouragingly, 75% of the respondents reported that upon completion of their telehealth interaction, there was no longer need for a physical interaction. This rate, however, varied between groups. Among people who sought general information or follow-up of a chronic medical condition, as many as 80% reported that there was no need for a physical follow-up. However, among those seeking care for a new medical problem, only 68% reported not needing a physical meeting. In other words, it appears that about one-third of the people with a new onset problem ended up needing a physical interaction with a practitioner despite the telehealth connection. The research team also identified some very important and impressive findings on who was actually using telehealth during the COVID-19 lockdown. Women were twice as likely to use telehealth as men, and Jews were 10 times more likely than Arabs to use them. People with a chronic condition were twice as likely to use telehealth than those without, and people with children under the age of 18 were 50% more likely to do so than were their counterparts without young children. Interestingly, neither age nor education were helpful in predicting telehealth use. Overall, the vast majority of consumers in the Brookdale study reported being satisfied with their telehealth interactions. 66% of users said that their telehealth experience was exactly what they expected, and an additional 
said that it exceeded their expectations. A different picture emerges, however, regarding the confidence that consumers had in telehealth. Only 67% of the survey respondents who experienced telehealth said that they had a good deal of confidence in the interaction. The remaining 33% said that they had only marginal or low confidence in the interaction. Similarly, only 62% said that they felt very comfortable with the experience, with the remaining 38% reporting that they were only moderately comfortable or less. It seems clear that there is more work to be done on improving patient comfort and confidence in telehealth. Back to you, Carrie. Thank you, Michael. When you look at the results in their entirety, what does this mean for the future of telehealth in Israel? Well, first of all, I'd say that this is an issue that has been brought into crisp focus in light of the pandemic. Telehealth, long a nice-to-have issue, has been turbocharged and brought into the forefront so we can expect some substantial improvements in this field in the near future. Second, I think that health policymakers should exercise caution in making overarching decisions about the development of telehealth services. While some of the lessons learned from the use of telehealth during the pandemic are certainly universal and applicable to the future, some are likely situational and reflect the current crisis more than they reflect future routine use of services. And finally, I think that the health policy team did a great job of keeping its finger on the pulse of health policy issues during the COVID lockdown. They were able to quickly identify an important emerging issue and were agile in organizing an important study in real time. The data in the survey will provide important baseline information for future studies during the next phases of the pandemic and far beyond. Thank you, Michael. And that is MJB News for the September 2020 board meetings. Thanks again to Smadel Somech for her story. And thank you, Carrie. And thank you, committee members and friends. Stay safe and healthy.